Hi, I'm not ready yet. Don't turn on the camera. <laughs> <laughs> hey, welcome back to the Backyard Professor Chess Videos. I am catching a cold. And my voice is really, really rough. And my throat is raspy, so I'm going to try to speak up. It's the day before Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving Eve. I want to make another video, and I want to make another video for you tomorrow for Thanksgiving Day, right? Um, this is a really fabulous game I've got for good chess instruction for us, helping us see again, learning how to translate the board position so that we know whether we're on offense, defense, which side of the board to go to, what's the best piece to move, etc. Because if you don't know this information, then you're lost. You can't possibly make the best move, right? What I'm going to do is show you the historic first Fegatello attack. And this occurred, this game, the inventor of the Fegatello attack, was Polario, a man named Polario. In fact, I've got a... Uh, <clears throat> I don't know if you can see it in the dark here. There's that handsome son of a gun. Look at that guy. Is he awesome or what? That guy looks like a chess player, doesn't he? Unlike some of us scruffs like myself. Polario, he lived from 1550 to 1610. This particular game, this was the first time on historical record we have of this uh, attack occurring. And the... Uh, the game was played in Rome in 1610. He played a man named Darminio. So let's get right on it. E4, E5. Knight F3. They're hitting the center, of course. Knight C6. Looks like it could be a Rui Lopez. Looks like it could be a Gioco Piano. Guaco Piano is how I used to pronounce it. You know, like Guaco Moly. <laughs> Yeah, whatever. <laughs> so, okay, where was I before I so rudely interrupted myself? Bishop c4 right here. And then knight f6. So, no, he didn't go for the guacamole opening. He went instead for the two knights defense, a very good alternative to the Gioco Piano. And now, white moves his knight a second time. Now, here we go. The bishop is hitting the f7. The knight is hitting the f7. So black sees, well, uh, this is an attack. How can I best thwart this attack? He puts the pawn up to d5. Good move because he blocks off the bishop, right? So now he has thwarted the Fegatello attack. And so e takes d5. However, in taking the pawn, his own pawn is still in the way of the bishop, so the attack is still thwarted. And then the black piece comes here to take the pawn, and the bishop is still blocked out of this Fegatello attack. And so he wins the day by refuting the attack except for one problem. The knight takes the pawn anyway. Welcome to the Fagatello attack. For those of you who don't know it, yet you have heard of it, we colorfully translate this as the fried liver attack. It is a dangerous attack. You really have to be careful. Um, Polario had a lot of fun with this, and we have seen lots of games. I haven't shown as many as I want to. I have some really good fried liver attack games that I will show. This one is the historic first, so it's kind of nice to show it. Sort of as a showcase for it, right? Well, there's no choice. The fork is really a tough fork on the queen and the rook, so the king has to take the knight. Now the king can't castle, and he is out in the open. At this point, white sees the position of the board, and this board says, 
attack. The king is in the open. He can no longer castle to get out of the way. So white's entire game is attack. Black understands because of what has happened, he is going to play defense. You have to know that to be able to make the best moves, right? This one is blatantly obvious, and that's fun to see. Based on that information, what would White's next good move be? He wants to press the attack against the king. Queen f3, check. True, normally you don't pull your queen out that early. That's not a good idea. In this instance, though, it works, and here's why. Not only do you attack the king, you also attack the knight. Now, the knight is already attacked by the bishop. Now it's attacked twice by the queen. It's only defended once by the queen. That knight is part of the black center, which is going to end up being the protection, the granite wall, as it were, for black's king. The best response to get out of check is to further the king out into the open and yet behind the center and protect that knight. Agreed that the king is not the best defender, but there is no other option at this point. <laughs> right? So that is why the king moves up here. Not here, not here. Not back. You want to defend this. Well, this means that from here on out, every move both players make begins to gel. We begin to see the sense of what they're doing. Number one, he is continuing his development, not just as development, but as a purpose of hitting the knight. So now we see white having one, two, three attackers. Black only has one, two defenders. And if white can eliminate the center, he will get to that king easier and win this game. Based on those factors, we know black needs to do something to support that center even stronger, right? It's true that that develops a piece, moving the bishop out, but it doesn't address the issue going on at this point. He has to protect his center, right? So the development being moved, um, for the most part, development as a principle is correct, but not that. And we understand that moving a piece twice, three times, four times in the opening is not advised. But in this instance, Black finds the right move. He does move his knight a second time, but look at the effect. A protector, a protector, a protector. So he reestablishes the strength of his center, even though he had to move a piece twice to do it. So, because of that, the question is, when we look at this, what are you doing, white? You can attack the king right now. You can go get that king right now. Queen to there attacks the king, right? Yes, but it's too early. It's too early to begin attacking the king because the rest of your team is not participating yet. Chess is a team sport. You don't see any professional or college football coaches sending just four men out on the field to play football, do you? No. They use the whole team. Same with chess. So white has the right idea here. There will be a time to attack the king. For right now, the objective is get rid of that center. So all focus is on the center. And how does he do this? 
d4. A very strong move. Right up the center, hitting the center on the pawn now. He opens up the diagonal for the bishop. Very nice, so that he can keep bringing more pieces against that center so that he can undermine the center and harvest the king. This is an outstanding move. The other thing you have to know, he realizes that black is not going to take back that pawn. If you're playing the black and you see, well, my pawn's in danger, I've got to take that pawn, no, because that will open your king, if you took that pawn, it would open your king up way too much. You want to make that wall solid. So that's a good move for white. Well, with that said, black could do this and then whatever white does next, do this, develop a bishop and support that pawn. But that's not the piece that's under the hardest attack. It's the knight. Besides, that takes two moves. And that's too slow. So, yes, that's a developing move. No, it's not the strongest move at this point. Black pushes the pawn. It makes beautiful sense why he plays this move at this time and not... Uh, a pawn over on this side or a pawn over on this side because now we count again one, two, three, four solid defenders. Well, three and a half if you count the king, right? And white has one, two, three attack pieces. So again, we see black solidifying his granite wall. That's good chess. It makes sense why we see him do this. White, because he pushed this wonderful pawn move to help undermine the center, now brings the bishop up to g5. It makes sense again for these reasons. At this point, White has pretty much everything against directly Black's center that he can put out. So it makes wonderful sense to attack one of the pieces that is supporting the knight. So it's an indirect undermining of the center. That's why that move makes such good sense. That's nice, isn't it? It's good to see stuff like that. Now, black's not going to block, block, <sighs> sorry. Oh, i got to get me liquid in me. Black has also put together all of the pieces that he can to build up his center. So, um, it's not now is the time to move an edge pawn to attack the bishop. That makes sense, right? In fact, that's a, that's a really decent move. Your bishop is under attack, so uh, you need to move it out of the way. You need to move it to safety, because we need every piece we can to undermine this center. This, yeah, you move it to safety, but it's not the best square, because you know block's going to go right to there instantly. And now you're virtually forced off of this diagonal onto this one. True, you're still hitting the center. You're actually hitting that pawn that the pawn is also attacking. That's true. But this is the tough part of this center, that knight. He's on a wonderful outpost. I mean, either one is going to work, but it takes away the power of the white because the bishop has the knight pinned to the queen. So by 
this move, he eliminates a defender, as it were, of the center. And yet he's kept all his attackers. So it makes sense that you don't want to go here because that does not address the situation. Sure, you move into safety, but you don't want to go back this direction. You don't want to go this way. What you want to do is swap the knight. That eliminates one of the protectors of the center. But you say, now hold on, uh, I like my bishops. I don't think that a bishop-knight swap is valuable because that gives up my bishop pair. You know, that leaves Black with both his bishops, and I don't have both my bishops anymore. In fact, Black did respond and retook that bishop. So I don't think that's a good exchange. The objective here is to undermine the center, not stick with principles as such. You know, every chess rule is made to be broken, right? That's the idea. So, uh, you are better off trading off the knight or your bishop for that knight. Here's one reason why. The queen here keeps the king tucked tight. Because he has been attacking the center here, 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 uh, white or black has to defend that center with as many pieces as he can. The king is blocking in his own white squared bishop. So, yes, you're left with one bishop. He's out here and very active, however. This bishop's going to have a tough time doing anything useful. That's what White saw. That's why that exchange makes good sense. Does that make sense? Now, so here we are. One, uh, two, three. And you've got one, two, three. What's White going to do next? What should you do? You could castle kingside and then move the rook over and there's another piece to fight that knight and undermine the center. But that takes two moves. Castling is correct, but castle queenside. Because we're understanding how to translate the position of the board and the way the game is unfolding, it makes sense to castle queenside. Your rook is directly on a future open file. You know black's not going to pull the trigger and take that pawn. There's no way. It exposes the king too much. You know white gets to choose the time when to pull that trigger. So he knows he has a future open file. Put the rook on it because, again, it hits the center. The nice thing is there's a queen behind there. Maybe for some future trap or something. You'll at least pin that knight to that queen. So this is a wonderful move that we understand why. Ah, he went queenside. You bet. Makes good sense. Black has done everything he can to solidify his center. He now pulls another piece, which is good chess. Get the whole army in as you can, right? And he has an open file. And the nice thing is he has an attack on one of the main pieces that is just happening to attack black center. It makes wonderful sense why he pulled that rook there. It really does. That's awesome. So white with the queen, your queen is under attack. Now... Uh, you could move her over to the edge of the board. She's still hitting the center here. You could do that. Uh, that's not an exceptionally good move. You could put the king in check and start attacking the king. However, what you'll end up doing is the king will go here and then here, here, and he's escaped. You're going to encourage the king to escape by attacking him at this point. 
you don't want him to escape because you will be able to attack him soon and undermine the center if you play your cards right. So the best move is forward and then that way you stay in contact with both of those central squares. Look at the power of that move centralizing the queen. That makes sense that that is the better square than this one or this one or even this one. That's wonderful chess. So, the rook, of course, uses the open file, fundamentally so. Take the f2 pawn. Now, notice this. Uh, they have both done everything they can to try to get rid or defend that center, right? So he starts a counterattack motion, and the idea is if I can get rid of some of Black's resources, or if I can distract him from taking away my center, if I can eliminate a few of his pieces through exchanges in a counterpunch, then I can save my center. So even though he is coming on a file away from the center, to the edge. He's taken over the seventh rank, which is good. He is playing this move to help his center. Isn't that interesting? That's a great move in chess. In this particular game, that is a great move. However, White sees the counterpunch and he takes the pawn. Now he's beginning to chip away at the black center and the king will fall if he gets the rest of that center. So this is becoming a dire situation for Black. And Black is up to it. Black comes up here to bishop g5 check. Well, all right. The king moves out of the way. Big deal. Hold on. Wait. Look at that board now. See, what Black is doing is he is picking up momentum. He is getting some more oomph. This, this position looks like he's coming around now, right? That position looks much stronger. He's got the majority of his players out on the field. That's a good-looking board at that point for Black. He really is doing something. He is gaining momentum. He is distracting White from accomplishing his goal. So this is a great counterattack at this point. He's doing everything he can right. Now watch what Black does. Perfectly sensible. Rook to D2. Nice. Look at what he's doing here. The bishop's on the outpost. The bishop guards the d2. He moves the rook to d2 to attack the rook that is attacking his center, pinning the knight to the queen. He is beginning to take the fight to white now. And all of this to protect his center. That's great chess. That really is great chess. White recognizes that he is under attack. The commentary says he really should go ahead and take the rook. I, I can't show you the variation. I'm going to set it up so that I can begin showing you the variations. There is a variation here where white would be perfectly fine taking that rook. Instead, at this point, he puts the pawn at h4 and puts the question to the bishop. Okay? So now he's trying to counterattack the counter-attack. <laughs> kind of interesting about that, huh? Of course, Rook is going to take out the Rook. Sure. Uh, if he can whittle down some pieces, then White won't have such a powerful attack against that center, and he won't lose the game. So, yes, he's, he's exchanging, right? And, of course, White exchanges the Rook Unfortunately, simply because of the nature of the way this game has gone for black, white ends up with the open file, pinning the knight to the queen. The bishop here is pinning the knight to the king. That knight is going to go on a world cruise, right? No, that knight's staying right home. White has that knight right where he wants him, man. Notice something. Unfortunately for black, he's still can't get 
two of his pieces into this fight. Really, what Black is facing is that. That's the situation. So you can see why Black's in trouble, huh? Because he never does get these two pieces in the game. So realistically, they don't exist. Not in this game. They're decoration, but that's it. They don't matter. So this is, in, this is a good illustration of why it's so critical to put your entire team on the field every game as you can. Do everything possible. And he has been. Black, Black has not made any blunder moves. Black has not made any major mistakes. Neither has White. This has been a very well fought out game. That's the other beautiful thing why I wanted to show you this game. It's not just a dumb game. And now Bishop takes the pawn, and uh, he, and he may as well because the bishop's under attack too. It's, he, he's he's in trouble. And now finally, the moment White has been working so hard for, bam, he destroys and obliterates Black's center, and Black, of course, will retake with the pawn. So you can see it's completely shattered, and White just keeps roaring. Rooks belong in open files. This is one very excellent illustration of the pure power they have when they do that. Finishes obliterating black center and threatening the queen. Right? So the queen comes up to rook d6. No, 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 no. Queen g5. So she comes over to here to safety and rook comes to d6 check. So the beginning of the end. And the king uh, dodges down to safety. And uh, the rook comes right over to here with another power move. And he puts the uh, pawn and the queen. He says, okay, your call. Which one do you want to keep? And, of course, Black chooses wisely to keep the queen, and he drops her down here. Now, stop. Take a look at what has happened. Because Black has attempted everything he can to counterpunch, he's one move away from a back rank, back rank checkmate. The fortune just seems to have completely flipped. Now, White has to play perfectly, or he's going to lose. We are one move away from White losing, not Black. <laughs> Isn't that astonishing? What an intriguing turnaround of events. We saw the black pieces scattered away from the black king and all of the white pieces against that black king. And now we see that there could be a quick end, a reversal. Black has to play precisely. <clears throat> At this time, seriously, that's not the best move. But if we're not as good of players as what we're going to show white is, that is always correct. You've got to give yourself an escape hatch, right? White uh, calculated this out, though. It's okay. It's okay. You just need to be aware, wow, a back rank mate can happen at a moment. So always keep your eyes open for that. That was close. That was very, very close. Black takes the knight. Or, uh, Black takes the knight. Rook takes the pawn. Check. Now, don't move away from the rook. Move toward the rook. Just in case you need it as in-game insurance, you can still take that piece if white messes up, right? Stay in contact with the rook. Now, at this point, white has a forced two-move checkmate. Now, I, when I was looking at that, and when I saw that, a, a forced two-move checkmate? 
I found a couple of different three-move checkmates. But a two-move checkmate? And I looked and I found it. And that's where I'm going to leave the board for you. I'm going to let you find the two-move checkmate because it's something you'll never forget again when you get into a position similar to this. So enjoy your chess puzzle at the end of the wonderful game that helps us grasp chess better. Okay, happy Thanksgiving Eve. Thanks for watching the BYP uh, chess videos. Be good, do well, have fun, be thankful, be nice. Uh, encourage others, build people up. Let's have some more fun. Enjoy your holidays. Be grateful for all we have. Be grateful for what we are. We are all working together to improve one another, to make each other happy, to help each other in our chess enjoyment, and to be better human beings. And that is worth living for and being thankful. So thank you. I will see you tomorrow on Thanksgiving with a very cool Thanksgiving Day chess game.